Well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming along um, tonight <clears throat> to listen um, to my uh, to my story. Uh, in a previous life, as Catherine alluded to, I wouldn't be here at the University of Auckland Law School. I would be probably down at Eden Park or maybe down in Christchurch readying myself for the big contest. But a lot of people have asked me in, uh, since I got out of the Murdoch Madhouse uh, some uh, seven or eight years ago and decided to do something else. They asked, why would a cricket writer start writing books about civil wars and an ongoing genocide in a place like Sri Lanka. Well, I said it was, it was quite uh, easy to make the transition. I decided I wanted to do something with my life that uh, was a bit better than writing about uh, runs and bowlers and wickets. <clears throat> so I started working uh, as a convener with the Tamil Refugee Council, but more importantly to me, we have a desperate issue in Australia with the uh, demonisation of refugees, with a deterrence policy, which we have at the heart, of course, any deterrence policy has at its heart suffering. So we must make these people suffer to deter others, and that's what we're doing in Australia. So what we do, we don't allow our refugees, we put them into the community, but we don't allow them to work. So these people are living in government-created poverty traps. They can't afford anything but their rent. They can't afford their food. They can't afford uh, much else. So I was driving a van around the southeast of Melbourne mostly, delivering food, delivering um, <clears throat> kitchenware, furniture, all those things to refugees. And as I was doing it, I was hearing story after story of tragedy and terror. And so much of it came from the, the Tamil groups. And it alerted me as a journalist. I mean, initially when you hear one story, you say to yourself, oh yes, you're, you're a bit cynical. That sounds so terrible, it couldn't possibly be true. But as they mounted up as a journalist, I started to inquire more and more. One of the first stories I heard was from a friend of mine. Um, he's become a good friend of mine now, a man called Suji. He talked about his trip all the way from Sri Lanka on a boat, a leaking boat. It was an 18-day journey, a journey that would take no more than probably a day on, on a normal vessel. The boat broke down after one day. The last five days, the people on the boat had no food, they had no water, they almost all died. And as uh, Suji was telling me this, I was saying to him, why on earth would you do something like that? And I was asking him this in the Dandenong Hospital at the time. I'd helped him to the hospital. It was about 7 o'clock in the morning. He'd rung me and said, I can't walk, I can't move. And I got round to his flat, I picked him up and I took him to the hospital and helped him in, in a wheelchair. He couldn't walk because of a back injury. He had severely <coughs> ruptured discs. And of course, um, I was naturally asking him more about the story about how he acquired this particular injury. He then started to tell me more and more. And he told me how, as a young Tamil man, like so many, he was picked up by the terrorist police. And when he got to the police station, he was trussed up like a chicken on a pole, suspended for hours from a ceiling in this police station. And then he told me the story about how each morning the uh, guards would take him and all the other Tamil boys out onto a parade ground. They were made to le kneel down and, and put their hands in front of them. And as they were kneeling down in a big long row, the soldiers came, the soldiers came and were kicking all these boys one by one in the small of the back with their steel cap boots. So suddenly I worked out why he had a ruptured disc and still has that massive problem today. But in a more general sense, Suji was telling me 
other things. One of the stories um, which I found um, uh, quite shocking and uh, led me on to other things was about the way the villages in his area in the east of Sri Lanka, in the Batakaloa region, the army would come in. A battalion, one group of soldiers would circle the village and the next, village, uh, next group would go and knock on the doors. And he said that if they found any young Tamil men like him, they were quickly bundled into vans, usually white, and taken off to the police station or army camp or whatever, and given the treatment that he'd got. If they found any young women, they were often raped in front of their families. But most disturbingly, if they found any nursing mothers, they would take out their knives and cut their breasts so they could not feed their children. Now these are the stories that you do not hear from the vast propaganda arm that is used to appease the Sri Lankan government by foreign governments and also within Sri Lanka. You do not hear these stories. The Sri Lankan government at great public expense spends, for example, $5 million or was spending $5 million with a company, a PR company, a British company called Bell Pottinger. Now, Bell, Bell Pottinger have very, very good credentials in laundering the image of oppressive regimes. Some of their clients include Bahrain, Uzbekistan, Belarus, and also a murderous dictator such as Pinochet. Now, cricket is a huge part of this propaganda machine. And all of you will know, as soon as you start talking about protesting against cricket or boycotts or whatever, people say, you can't mix sport and politics. Well, they said the same in the 1970s as the apartheid regime was being challenged by some very, very brave people and of course we had a lot of boycotts and most of the academic studies of the breakdown of apartheid now will tell you, will tell you very clearly that it was the sporting boycotts that played the biggest part in the breakdown of the apartheid regime as opposed to the economic sanctions which while they contributed con uh, significantly it's far easier to subvert economic sanctions than it is for sporting boycotts. And the boycotts um, of countries like Israel, for example, if you look at your history, you'll know that they were subverting the boycotts daily against uh, the, uh, in, in South Africa. But with the cricket, it was, um, uh, with the sport, it was entirely a different matter. The South African public, and this has been written a lot, gradually the white South Africans um, loved two things more than anything in their lives. It was uh, cricket and rugby. And when they'd been denied this for so long, for so long, it weakened their resolve to continue supporting within the country that regime. They didn't want that isolation anymore and it contributed massively. So the other side of this, of course, is, is that um, uh, sport and politics are inextricably entwined in Sri Lanka. Let me give you a few examples. The sports minister, for example, runs the cricket team. All the stadiums are run by the army. The sports minister, when there's an announcement, say we've got uh, new selectors, we've got a new captain, all those sort of things, it's the sports minister who appears on television to announce it. And he sacks people, this, that and the other thing. And even that man there, Raja Paksa, has shown himself on many occasions to be the chief selector. One of those occasions was in 2011 when he rang the cricket team while they were on a tour of England and he demanded that the man in the middle there, one of the greatest batsmen that Sri Lanka's ever had and captains called Sanath Jayasaraya. Now the team management were bemused by this phone call mainly because Sanath Jayasaraya was 41 years old and hadn't played for three years. But, why would they want him in the team? 
well, he just happened to be recently elected into Parliament and was part of the Rajapaksa regime. So why not mix a little bit of sport and politics for promotion? So that's what they did. The British press called it a scandal. Jaya Saria played uh, a one-day game against England and then disappeared uh, again back into retirement. And didn't make many runs, by the way. <laughs> now, the connection between cricket and Rajapaksa and the regime was very, very strong. You'll see that man there. That man, Ajantha Mendes, he is one of their best spin bowlers. He's played uh, in the test team, in the one day team. He's not in the squad for this uh, one day side at the moment, but he plays in all the T20s these days. Well, Ajantha Mendes has another role in life. He's also a gunner in the artillery of the Sri Lankan army and was very much involved in that artillery, artillery regiment as many, many thousands of people were being bombed and shelled in the last days of the war, which has led to the war crimes investigation, which the UN estimates 70,000 people, 70,000 innocent civilians were slaughtered. Now, Rajapaksa, of course, makes the most of these things. And there he is as guest of honour at Ajantha Mendes' wedding a couple of years ago. So it's pretty obvious, isn't it, that a brutal dictator uh, can see how best to launder his own image. Now, cricket is also a great vehicle to create awareness of the true nature of a country beyond the boundary. A couple of years ago, we organised some rallies at the MCG, the SCG, when Sri Lanka were touring uh, over a five-test series, or three-test series, I think it was, and played a lot of one-day games. Um, those um, rallies were very, very successful. We got a lot of publicity, and the one reason we got it was successful is because we made the connection with cricket. And the, and the political side. We were able to stand outside the Melbourne Cricket Ground when 60,000 people went into the first day of the Boxing Day Test match. Over a couple of uh, matches, we actually handed out 20,000 leaflets to people explaining the situation for Tamils in Sri Lanka. And we got a lot of traction out of this, not just with the media, but with the people. We were able to engage with an audience we could never engage with before. And we got traction, we got a lot of reaction, and I'll give you a good example. Uh, the next day at uh, the Tamil Refugee Council, we received a phone call. It was from an employee at the MCG. He said, I walked into the uh, cricket ground yesterday to do my job, and I took one of your leaflets. I sat down and read it, and learned all about the oppression of the Tamil population. I knew nothing about what was going on in Sri Lanka. I'm actually ashamed that I sat there and made money out of a game yesterday and I want to donate my wage to the Tamil Refugee Council. So we were able to change perceptions. Of course we knew if we were successful when the High Commissioner of, uh, to Australia from Sri Lanka, Admiral Thasara Samarasinghe, tried to stop these protests. He announced on radio that Australia and you Australians are only using your freedom of speech and freedom of assembly laws to do this, and I'm going to put a stop to it. In other words, try this on in Colombo, baby, and you'll be in a deep, dark, dank torture chamber before you can flick your fingers. Uh, on the first morning, um, I, knew, I knew what was happening because the... Um, security chief of the MCG, who I knew through my cricket contacts, rang me. Uh, sorry, he came over to me and said to me, um, do you know this guy Samar uh, Singh? And I said, oh yeah, yeah, what's he up to? He said, look, he just rang and demanded that we shut you all down and kick you off the, uh, kick you off the uh, forecourt there at the MCG. Get rid of you. And I said, what'd you say to him? He said, I said to him, this is Australian, mate. <laughs> Now, 
Uh, Sam Arasinga, of course, you'll find uh, the details of his, uh, uh, the accusations against him as one of the war criminals at the end of the war as well. But um, it's standard procedure for the Sri Lankan government to do these sort of things. And it's very um, interesting that they do these things. They intimidate people on foreign soil. And our governments do nothing about it. I actually asked the Foreign Minister of Australia, how come a foreign government can intimidate Australian citizens on Australian soil? Where does, you know, what's going on? I got no reply, of course. But as I said, it's standard procedure for the likes of Samara Singer. They go around taking photos of Tamils at rallies to scare them off. They send the photos back to Colombo and uh, often the relatives will receive knocks on the door from the security police usually at midnight for added effect. And Mr. Samara Singer, uh, true to form, I found out only a month ago, had been to Monash University, who are the publishers of my book, and tried to uh, get them, he had meetings with the Vice-Chancellor and the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, and tried to get them to withdraw their support from the book. And I'm told that he used, and this is an interesting thing, being in a university, he was using the leverage, or the leverage he thought he had through, there's a, um, a college in Sri Lanka now called in Colombo, called Monash College. It is a pathway, uh, a college, a pathway education facility to Monash University. You spend a year there and then you can get into Monash University. There's a lot of this happening around the world and that was what was trying to be used. So it's interesting to think about the links between education in this country and links with some very, very brutal regimes. But in the end, the success was probably confirmed by one thing to me. The uh, biggest um, uh, broadsheet newspapers in Australia, uh, the Fairfax Media, the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age ran a reader's poll. And the question was asked in this reader's poll, should Sri Lanka be banned from international cricket? And that was our, our whole, the tenor of what we were saying the whole time. Well, we got 66% of people saying yes. Now, I was absolutely shocked because I had no idea of the awareness we were actually creating. But I can guarantee you that not only three months earlier would we not have got, not have got 66%, that question would not have even been asked in a paper like The Age or the Sydney Morning Herald. So that tells me a lot about the value of grassroots agitation. I'm not a believer in the, in, in the, the political uh, people or politicians or leaders. I believe they are followers and it's up to the grassroots to drag them kicking and screaming their own way. Now, as I said, the, um, it was a very successful group, that's us in Sydney, um, we got together, um, we had a bit of a hassle there with the, uh, with the police who were trying to force us away from the, the Sydney cricket ground, we didn't have that problem in Melbourne, but as you can see we got plenty of uh, good signs out, and, you know, 40, 50,000 people reading those signs it was fantastic. Now what I would really like to do out of that experience is to urge New Zealand fans and, and New Zealanders in general this week to think about what they're endorsing as they go along to the cricket. Just think about it. And when sport is used as a cover for war crimes, we all need to think twice. And we all need to think twice about, say, taking Sri Lanka as our second team through the competition. Just think twice. I would ask you, would you like to see that man? Robert Mugabe invited to the World Cup as Mahinda Rajapaksa was by John Key's government. When the former England captain, Michael Atherton, watched a documentary that Channel 4 in the UK had produced. It was called Sri Lanka, The Killing Fields. It has since become the No Fire Zone, uh, an, an additional documentary which is out and about now. Michael Atherton, who's now writes for the London Times and broadcasts cricket on Sky Sports, wrote that he was horrified at what he had seen. And he said, and he asked a very interesting question, because only recently, 
before he was writing this, Australia and England had banned tours to Zimbabwe because of the politics in that country. So, Atherton asked the general question, if we don't play against Zimbabwe, why are we playing against Sri Lanka? And indeed, not even him is facing a current war, war crimes investigation. And yet, incredibly, 